Welcome back or welcome to the Train Right Podcast. Coach Adam here, your host, and I've got a wonderful guest on today's show. She's a top physiologist at the U.S. Olympic Paralympic Training Center, running the Hatsi and Athlete Performance Lab. She's also a longtime CTS coach and a great friend. And before all that, she was a professional triathlete herself. So Lindsay Golich, welcome to the show. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, super excited to be here. Um, always fun to see uh, old faces. Um, yeah, and just be a part of this and share all sorts of good knowledge that we've got right now. Yeah, absolutely. Do, do I have that old of a face, Lindsay? Is that? No, you know, interesting. man. Uh, then, wow, just, wow. You know, we've known each other, gosh, what now, like 15, 16 years? It's been a while, huh? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it, it has been a while. But, uh, you know, between the pandemic and congratulations on your daughter, and your new job and all the things like I, I actually have not seen you for for several years so yeah it's been crazy yeah well i mean our listeners may have caught some of your wisdom over the past or some of the podcasts that you've been on lately but could you tell us a bit more of your current role at the training center and the athletes you work with yeah so um as you mentioned i work at the olympic uh, and paralympic training center in colorado springs and uh, we're located pretty much downtown. Uh, we've got a great facility. We've been on a COVID quarantine lockdown. So unfortunately it hasn't been open to the public for tours, but hopefully in 2022, or if you're in the area, come check it out. Lots of great things to see. Um, in Colorado Springs, I have a couple different hats. Um, I run our athlete performance zone, um, which really we uh, help all athletes just coordinate using of our different facilities, whether it's our environmental room, just our open area, other equipment like our Alter G or hemoglobin mass testing, different things that we have access to. Um, the athletes that I work really closely with are cycling, triathlon, and a few water sports like canoe, kayak, um, and then a handful of other athletes and some individual events um, as well. And uh, those uh, those programs are the programs that I work you know directly with the athletes with the coaches with their high performance staff and traveling to training sessions competitions training camps throughout the world um, and then as well just with the training center we've got winter sports too that come through so i've had a, my ability to just tap into some of our winter athletes here and there primarily just for testing or just working on altitude if we're you know if they're traveling to a higher climate uh, for training and preparation for competition yeah. So you, you're wearing a lot of hats over there, aren't you? Yeah. Which is great. I mean, it, yeah. it's fun. It keeps you on your toes. Um, yeah. you know, like anything, like the, the human body can only be stimulated in like a few different ways, but it's the mm -hmm. art of it, how we all put it together. And, uh, it's what keeps us all going and it's pretty exciting. Exactly. Exactly. And this, this is exactly why I wanted to get you on the show because, <laughs> Uh, Olympics are coming up and Tokyo is scheduled to be one of the hottest, if not the hottest Olympics on record. So uh, where is that going to rack and stack with previous Olympic games, Lindsay, for temperature? Yeah. So, I mean, as you said, Tokyo, it is uh, going to be or has the potential to be the hottest Olympic games to date. I um, you know, even though we're a year postponed, we're only a year postponed or it's an exact year postponement. So it didn't change the time of year that we're actually holding the games. Um, when we look back, gosh, probably all the way back to, I don't know, um, the 1980s, uh, from now, uh, all the way covering however many Olympic Games that is, there's only a few that would rival it, and that would be Beijing, uh, Summer Olympics, Athens was also pretty close, and Atlanta. Those kind of were the top three leading into Tokyo, but Tokyo, relative to those, we're kind of looking anywhere between maybe three to 10 degrees Celsius, depending on the location of each event. Mm -hmm. And the IOC um, did have the ability to relocate a few of the events. So like the marathon and race walk, they actually moved them quite a bit north um, within the country of Japan. And that really helped to change the humidity levels and the overall temperature just to moderate some of those extreme environmental conditions that the athletes are gonna be facing. Gotcha. Gotcha. So you said three, three to 10 degrees higher. What are the absolute temperatures that athletes are going to be competing in? Yeah. You know, if, if we, when we're doing a lot of our training and heat assessments, we're looking at kind of worst case scenario. So on the temperature scale, um, we could see somewhere as high as 45 degrees Celsius in the peak of the day. 
Now that's not likely. Um, I know um, I've been there in the past in, in the summer months in July and August, and it hasn't quite gotten that hot on, on an absolute temperature, but the real or the feels like temperature gets pretty close with the, the combination of temperature, humidity, and just the sun and, and different things that are happening. So um, it's going to be pretty warm. Uh, the other things with Tokyo, because of where it's located, it doesn't have these really big shifts in temperature throughout the day. So mm -hmm. the sun comes up at 4.30. It's, you know, the land of the rising sun. So the sun is up early. And, and really by 6 a.m., the temperatures are already quite warm. Mm -hmm. We hit our peak of the day pretty similar to um, here in Colorado, right around 12 to 3 o'clock. Um, but it takes a while for the temperatures to cool down at night. So, you know, a lot of the games and the events from team sports to individual sports like cycling and triathlon and, and running, they're happening, you know, peak heat time of the day. Um, so we're anticipating standard temperatures uh, somewhere between like at the very low end, maybe 30 degrees Celsius, all the way up to 40 degrees Celsius. Um, and again, that feels like in in U.S. terms, the feels like temperature is going to range somewhere between 100 to about 115 degrees, like throughout the day during this competition. Oh, that that is pretty warm. And as I mentioned in the intro, heat is a, is is a stress, and it can't be yeah. overlooked. So you know, we're talking a lot about heat, but uh, just real simple, Lindsay. Like, uh, what is heat stress, and how does it affect human performance? Yeah. So. When we talk about stress and strain, really we have this environmental stress, um, which is really the level of intensity. Um, so, you know, we're looking at the temperature and humidity, but ultimately how does that place that strain on the body? And that strain is things that we're looking at like core temperature and sweat rate and perceived effort. And really that's what we're trying to balance um, as we go through a heat acclimatization um, and also just uh, once we're on the ground, trying to figure out like things like proper hydration, pre-cooling, and during cooling for certain events. Um, and that's, that's been our biggest focus um, at the Olympic uh, Committee here, for, I would say for the last five years. You know, this already goes back pretty much, we knew the same, we knew Tokyo was happening as we were getting ready for Rio, um, but we knew the heat was gonna be a, a big uh, obstacle for a lot of athletes. Um, so yeah, again, we're, you know, we're just trying to balance everything within training. It's just tipping scales that, we can't control the temperature and environment, but we can control or prepare physiologically better so we can tolerate those environmental stresses. Gotcha. Gotcha. And when you're talking about those extreme temperatures that athletes will compete in Tokyo, I mean, you're, you gave a presentation to CTS a few weeks ago. And one of the numbers I pulled out from there was, I mean, decreased performance can start to occur in around like 86 degrees Fahrenheit or about 30 degrees Celsius. And that's like a five to 7% decrease. Is that right? Yeah. 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 I mean, it, it's quite drastic, right? When you look yeah. at it and, you know, the thing with heat is that um, it's nothing new. You know, the, the U S mm. has had a huge focus on heat. Um, and, you know, when you go back to the literature, when did we start really focusing on heat? And it was not specific to athletes, but during wartime, but really that's when we started looking at, at how heat was in fact impacting negatively our soldiers getting on the ground, coming from the US and being dropped into these really hot and humid climates. So a lot of the research that we've been going through for the last 50, 60 years, which is, is quite interesting. And, and over the time we've been able to manipulate it towards athletes. And, and we do know that performance is decreased as temperature rises. And yeah, there's the obvious there that dehydration happens, our core temperature rises. Um, but we don't know, without doing the proper testing, it's hard to determine which is a limitation for each person. And, and that's where I love my job from a physiology perspective is that we know, yes, there's a roughly a five to 7% decrease in performance for more like time trial type of events. So we're not gonna see a five to 7% decrease even in a 1500 meter running race. But by the time we get to like a 5K and 10K, in the marathon, yeah, that's when we're going to see potential decreases in performance. So we're not likely to see world records being broken in the 10K um, and the marathon, those type of events in Tokyo, um, because we're trying to mitigate that heat stress and that strain that's being placed on the body. Gotcha, gotcha. So those are, you know, events really not going you know, much more over an hour, but what about like men's and women's road races that are going to be 
anywhere between three, six, seven hours. Yeah, I know the the men's race, road race is crazy, right? I mean, it, that's going to be looking to be like a six plus hour day. It's going to be yeah. pretty epic. Um, and the course is is really hard. I mean, the the terrain is going to be beautiful to watch on TV. I mean, it, it's amazing where they go through, but uh, yeah. the course is hard. It's 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 out there. You're exposed. There's lots of climbing. Um, so uh, you know, in addition to the heat, just the stress of the course is going to be challenging. But uh, you know, for that, we're really trying to prepare the athletes on the ground prior to arriving. So there's been a lot of heat acclimatization that the athletes are going through and, and different strategies. Mm-hmm. Um, there's not a one size fits all. And part of that is just, we have to figure out what each athlete and program can respond to and doesn't hinder their training or race preparation, right? So you could, you know, go into that sauna protocol, which maybe we'll touch base in a little bit of, you know, is a, a 10 day or seven day or 14 day in a row sauna of protocol, the best for physiological adaptations? Yes. But is that the best for physiological adaptations and with the training stimulus and recovery? Probably not. So those yep. are the things that we're trying to figure out how to, you know, balance it all for each athlete. Um, on the ground for an event like the road race for the men's race, well, we're going to do our best with hydration and utilize, uh, you know, hyperhydration type of drinks, uh, so the athletes can start the race carrying a little bit more uh, plasma volume, a little bit more body fluid that they can reap from if they if they get themselves in a deficit. Fingers crossed that the care vans will be there and that we can really rely heavily on, you know, getting bottles to the athletes throughout the race and and little packets of ice and different things to keep them cool. Um, so that's going to be the biggest challenge is that depending on what happens within the race, the splits of the groups and different things of, of being able to manage that. But as a team, we've got everything really dialed in, um, team leaders and Jim Miller at USA Cycling, you know, this isn't their first showdown. They, they know what to do. They know what to expect. Right. And, and we've got a lot of things covered and, and really dialed in for those races. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And we've had a few of uh, Jim's athletes that will be going over to Tokyo on this podcast as well. And uh, kind of talking about some of their uh, strategies for that. Um, But what you said before, just in terms of human physiology responding in a few different ways, and then some of the other things that you were talking about is really the strategies that you're focusing on heat acclimatization, pre-cooling and hydration. So let's, let's start with heat acclimatization can you tell our listeners like what that means and how you do it like on a high level? Sure. Yeah. So heat acclimatization is ultimately you're trying to prepare the body physiologically to tolerate the heat more effectively or more efficiently. So what happens is that during this timeline, which we've got a short timeline, a short period, which might be just a five day protocol versus a really long, uh, long-term protocol, which might be somewhere about two to three weeks, is that we're, we're looking to have an increase of sweat rate. So the body sweats sooner and sweats more. So that acts as a natural cooling environment. Um, we're also looking for the body to retain some plasma volume, which is the water retention part of, in our, of our blood. And then again, that helps us to pull from a little extra fluids during moments of stress or high strain. Um, our thermal, our ability to thermal regulate to just dissipate that heat more effectively. Part of that's the sweat rate, but cooling is just uh, practice makes perfect in those situations. And also, I find one of the biggest things is just the athlete perception, is that your ability to, to tolerate the heat is improved drastically. And a lot of these things happen within just the first five days or five exposures of heat but they're not short, they're pretty short term. So they don't have long-term lasting benefits. So for something like Tokyo, where even though the men's road race is a one day event, they're gonna be on the ground for seven days leading into Tokyo. So we can't just plan for you know race day that everything's gonna be good. We actually wanna make sure that we're acclimatized before we hit the ground running. So when they get there, we're not having to deal with travel fatigue, the stress of the Olympics, the exposure to the heat and all these other things is that we're trying to minimize as much as we can. Um, so we want to try to do all this prior to getting on the ground and not relying on those first, you know, five or seven days that the athletes are there. Gotcha. Gotcha. And so when, when we are talking about like the acute responses to, to heat, you're saying that it takes kind of one to five days and happens pretty quickly, but it can go away pretty quickly too, if you're not uh, having exposure and in, in sessions in the heat, right? 
Yeah, exactly. So there's been a lot of good research out there um, over the last five years that showed just five exposures of one hour a day to a heat in a an endurance to sub threshold type of intensity mm -hmm. will give you a good heat acclimatization. So again, the thing is that if we just did five days and then we go straight to our vent, we're not necessarily going to have the maximum, you know, ability for increasing our sweat rate or plasma volume or tension. We're going to get maybe about, you know, 80 to 90% of it. So pretty close, but you know, as we're going to the Olympics for athletes that have been preparing some of them their entire life for this one moment or the last five years, or even the last two years, um, that we want to make sure that we've got it dialed in and that again, we're hundred percent in. So we're, we're looking more at like a, a 14 to 20 day uh, protocol. And again, yep. it's not 14 to 20 days exactly in a row. So yep. if an athlete is leaving, let's say July 1st, um, we've started things on June 1st. So we've, we've given ourselves, you know, a month prior to again, find that balance with heat exposures, um, versus training and recovery and different stimulus to make sure that we've got that right balance of, you know, stress and recovery and adaptation. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. And then what are some of the aspects that you're measuring when you are doing, and we'll talk about protocols here in just a minute. So listeners can um, get a little more detail on what we're talking about here, but uh, when you are doing a session with an athlete or you're trying to uh, influence these parameters to get them more resilient to the heat so that, they're ready to go ground ground on the ground running. Um, are you measuring like sweat loss, sodium? Like what are you measuring in your fancy lab over there? Yeah. So, you know, sometimes we pull out all the gadgets and other times it's a, a simple pen and paper. So when we do our initial heat stress assessments, we'll yep. look at core temperature, how well an athlete, so they'll actually swallow a small pill. It's about the size of a multivitamin. Mm -hmm. um, and that will measure their internal core heat. So we're looking at how they're tolerating the heat, that heat buildup, or, or how quickly they're dissipating it. Um, in addition to, you know, drinking cold slurries or putting ice towels over their head, um, how well that acts as a band-aid, so to speak, on, you know, aiding in a, a, maybe a, a short dip in core temperature and how long it takes to come back to that initial, um, that heat sink that we're looking for. Um, we'll measure sweat rate. So some simple things of like pre and post body weight, that's something that everyone can do, you know, jump on a scale before training and after training and see how much water loss you've lost. Um, in addition to that, we're going to measure how much you drink and eat. So all the fluids going in, all the fluids coming out um, and even nutrition. So one thing that we'll do with our, our running program is that a lot of athletes have a hard time tolerating a lot of fluid to take in at once so that we just work on training the gut. So we see how much you can actually drink with each drink. And sometimes it's a lot less than what an athlete thinks that we might find that they're only drinking one to two ounces. And we need to get that number up to maybe five or six based upon the temperatures we're anticipating or the duration of that, of their event. And so you drink your bottle, we weigh the bottle before and after and see what you've drank. Um, on each, each sip. Uh, we'll look at heart rate, we'll look at power if they're on a bike, we'll look at power and all the running mechanics if they're running, perceived effort. So just on that simple scale of six to 20, someone's pointing out where they're, where they're looking and how they're feeling. Um, and I mean, in any day we'll do all of it or some of it or none of it. Sometimes it's just an athlete needs to go in there and, and do the training. And we know that it's creating a stressful environment, but that's, that's the goal of the day. Um, the, one of the more important things that we can look at and to confirm that there's a heat, of, heat adaptation going on is that sweat sodium concentration. So from the beginning, maybe from day one, we'll put patches on and look at how salty an individual sweat is, as well as how much volume of sweat they're losing. Over the time of their heat adaptation is that we should know that their sweat rate increases so again, that you're sweating more, you're cooling your, your body off more, but that sodium concentration will actually decrease because you're sweating out a higher volume of water. So that's another way that we can actually assess in addition to seeing how your body internally with a core, te core temperature pill is uh, kind of tolerating that heat. So if uh, one of our listeners or, or um even myself or whoever is, is listening to this and they, they want to make sure that they're 
acclimatized to the heat and they don't have core temperature pills or uh, sodium testers or something like this, what would be like one thing that listeners could tune into or hone in on that would indicate that they are um, adapting to the heat? Yeah, I mean, I think the most simple thing is actually just looking at your perceived effort during a training session. Yep. So, you know, when you're doing heat stress, you're not going in and you're not doing these, you, well, typically we're not recommending to do these really high intense type of intervals. So because of that, we're doing more aerobic or threshold type of training that we're actually not going to see a drop off in power per se, um, the more well-trained you are. So that's not a great tool. So you can't say, oh, I got through my third interval and I finally held it together. Well, that's hard to know if that's just a training adaptation or the heat adaptation. Um, when you're doing things that are sub threshold. So power is not a great one, but again, perceived effort, just how you feel. Um, heart rate is a tool, but again, there's a lot of factors that can go into that if, if you're not looking at it consistently. So you could be dehydrated prior to starting and that could really be funky with your numbers. Um, and then just again, really the most important thing is, is I would say for a lot of athletes is almost trusting the process is that this is a, a tried and true heat acclimatization is nothing new. Again, as I mentioned, we've been doing this for many, many years. When we do all these fancy gadgets with the core temperatures and, and the foot sodium concentration, yes, we're looking at the marginal gains. We're looking at that fraction of a percent is a difference in a, in a time trial of getting first versus tenth. Um, but at the same time, trusting the process. And if you're doing it correctly and incorporating it correctly in your training, I can say wholeheartedly that you will have a positive heat adaptation that will occur within just as little as again, five to seven days of, of those heat exposures. Yeah, I, I agree with that fully. And I was anticipating that that would be your response. Um, but that's just it. When you are acclimatizing the heat, when you're tolerating it better, I would say with my athletes, the number one thing that I hear uh, is that I just feel a lot better and they're able to make, you know, moves in the, in the race or in the group or, you know, tolerate the pace longer as opposed to having the drop off that kind of stuff. So um, some of these tried and true protocols that we're talking about, could you walk us through one or two uh, protocols that you use with your athletes? And it could be, um, and I think you mentioned that having like a um, multifaceted approach um, is is good for this, meaning there's not just one way to get heat um, to prepare well for it, but what have you done with some of your triathletes? Yeah, so with a lot of the triathletes and, and the cyclists as well is that I would say it's really individual. So um, uh, Dr. Stacy Sims uh, came up with the sauna protocol. Gosh, it's probably been 10 to 12 years now at this point. Um, and, and again, she had taken it from a hybrid of other, other individuals, but really put it out there and publicized it and put some very specific numbers to it and showed what was actually happening. Um, within that protocol, we're really looking at like a seven to 12 day, um, everyday heat exposure in a sauna situation after an intense training session. So an intense training session could be something on the bike or run that's quite long, um, uh, so, you know, if we're looking at our, uh, uh, cycling athletes, it's definitely something over like a three hour ride, um, or an intense session could be a 90 minute session with really hard, intense intervals or maximal type of effort. And then we would jump immediately into a sauna. The sauna though, we have to keep in mind, it's a really short, uh, period of time. We're not really trying to get in there and see how long we can stay in the sauna. We might start with just 10 to 15 minutes and work our way up to 25 minutes. Um, and the sauna has shown really great success uh, within a training adaptation for the heat. The tricky part is that high risk, high reward. So it's one of the most stressful type of heat adaptations that you can do for uh, training. And the stress I mean is that just the additional stress it places on the athlete or the body and that if you're not controlling for that within your training block or on the back end of your training block, you may really just come out excessively fatigued. So we want to make sure that we've done uh, kind of like dry runs of it prior to doing our full, you know, two week type of exposure. Um, but we do that with a few athletes. But again, we've done multiple dry runs of it. So we know how they're going to respond and recover from that type of stimulus. Okay. What temperature are we talking about in the sauna? 
Yeah, so for the sauna, we really want to see it above 140 degrees um, yep. Fahrenheit. And so that's pretty normal. Most saunas get up there pretty, pretty easily. Um, and that's the difference is that in a steam room, um, most steam rooms get up to about 120 to 140. Saunas can get up quite easily to 120 to up to 180 degrees. So um, the, just the time and then holding that environment, the most consistent a sauna allows for that type of uh, environment to occur. So you know that there's going to be some listeners who have a sauna or access to a sauna and they want to try this. What would you yeah. recommend to them if they're like, yeah, I'm going to yeah. go for it? Yeah, as I said, it's kind of like high risk, high reward, right? But yeah. that also means high risk that if we don't do it correctly, you're, you could really mess things up. So, yeah. you know, I'm sure you talked about altitude, right? Like living in an altitude tent, we're looking for that 1% gain in a, in a heat adaptation. Yes, we're talking about a delay in heat um, ex exhaustion basically in performance, yeah. but we're not actually stopping it. We're just delaying the, the start of that happening, but it has the potential still to happen even, even after going through a heat acclimatization protocol, but hopefully we're delaying it by minutes, uh, you know, which allows for, you know, better decision-making or reaction times in a type of a, an event. But, um, with that, I would say that if you are looking to do it, let's say you're getting ready for like a Kona example, and you and you live in Colorado where it's hot and dry, but where we're not nearly as hot um, and dry or humid as Hawaii, that I would say if you're getting ready for an event now where you've, you're looking at the calendar and you've got three or four months to prepare for it, is that I would look at doing maybe a three-day period, you know, soon and see how you respond to it and what the fatigue how that, how that impacts your training. Um, so then you have some feedback again on how you need to adjust your training during that cycle and or immediately after it. Um, and then in another month or month and a half, do again, another three or five day period. Because again, you're, you're getting more fit as you're going through it. So I know not everything's 100% as if you're going into your final taper. Um, but again, you're, you're, you're hopefully not doing something brand new, something that you've never done prior to your maybe most important race of the season or your whole entire life. So, yeah, yeah, that's really good advice. And I, and I really, the reason I bring it up is um, I probably can't stress enough of thinking, thinking about the whole stress, the whole bucket of stress that you have going on training, stress, life stress. Now you add in heat stress and you do need to balance it out. So you don't overcook yourself because you said high risk, high reward, but you know, that risky component is you come out like way too zonked and like a medium zonk. This is what I see from athletes and they, they can't put their finger on like why they're tired all the time. And maybe they perform like pretty good here. And it's like, Oh no, I'm fine. But then they like kind of bad performance for a few and they're like, what's going on. So coach Lindsay, like, how do you, how do you balance that with your athlete? Is it initially just be safe and like take training intensity down and volume moderate as you introduce uh, heat in or how do you do it? Yeah. So um, I would say really as a whole, you're, you want to probably decrease the total volume somewhere between 10 to 15% mm -hmm. um, right off the bat. And that, again, when I look at things, I'm always going to take a slightly more conservative approach yep. um, because when I when ultimately the most important thing for any type of race environment, whether it's hot, humid environment, high, cold um, altitude, whatever it might be, is to show up as fit as you can be and as healthy as you can be. So when we're talking about heat and all these other things, we're looking at the marginal gains. And yes, they're important, but we gotta make sure that we're not compromising our overall training. So again, for the training perspective, I would say volume and intensity, I would decrease just right off the top by 15, 10 to 15%, um, even just for that three day period, just so you know how you're gonna respond. Um, and then as you kind of go through trials of it, then you can figure out maybe how to layer things back in and what's appropriate and what may not be. Um, you know, just an example, we had a lot of our track cyclists just go to Knoxville for cycling nationals and, um, uh, you know, all, all the track athletes, they're getting ready for a four minute race, not a, you know, a three hour race. So that in itself was challenging, but due to COVID, there's been almost no racing. So we needed just the stress of a race environment, but we're hoping is going to give us a slight uh, ability just to see how everyone res responds in the heat and everyone's coming back. And it took a lot more out of the athletes than we actually had anticipated. Um, even though it wasn't as hot or as humid as it could have been there, 
um, during during nationals, but there's still just an element of just being out there in that environment, you know, doing things after the race or just some Olympic fun day things that it just took its toll. Um, so on the back end, even though we had this perfect plan, you know, for a few days back here in Colorado, we had, we had to adjust everything for a few days for some athletes just to kind of get back. So even if you, you think you've got it all dialed in, you know, we're people, we're not machines, we're still going to change There's different stresses. So you just have to be adaptable. And I think that's the most important thing is that if you're working with a coach, you got to communicate really well with your coach because that's what they're there for. If you're coaching yourself, don't be afraid to take something off. It's, it's better on these uh, heat stresses and different things to eliminate something than try to keep adding more and more things to your schedule. You took the words right out of my mouth. I was going to say, so for the, all those DIYers out there <laughs> and for those uh, coached by an athlete, make sure exactly the words that you just said, but just, you know, communication and like self-awareness, like if yeah. anything, just be conservative because heat, if you're not adapt or acclimatized to it, it generally does take way more out of you than you think, no matter how tough you think you are. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 And then I know you're saying there's, you know, sauna is not the only one. So before we move on to, I just want to, you know, reiterate. Sure, yeah. Yeah. I, I would say that's kind of a high risk, high reward one. But yep. um, I think I mentioned earlier that we're doing kind of a combination of different heat stresses. So um, we might use things where we're mimicking the environment. So in Colorado Springs at the training center, we've got this amazing room where we can match temperature, altitude, humidity to really any environment throughout the world. So for Tokyo, we might do a couple just more um, aerobic or easy spins for cycling or easy runs for triathletes or runners in the room at those conditions. Um, maybe it might be anywhere between 45 to minutes to 90 minutes long. So nothing really, really intense and nothing really long. Um, if you don't have access to a room like that and you're going somewhere it's hot and humid, you know, pool deck could work well. You could probably make something in your house, but if you do make sure you have like a, uh, a weather reader so you actually know how hot and how humid you are and not just guessing you can get them online for you know 40 bucks it's a good 40 dollar investment um, if you're going to do something like that in your house just to make sure that you're not overdoing it um, and then simple things like overdressing again these are not you know groundbreaking concepts but going out for a ride and in kind of middle of the day and wearing long sleeves and hats and gloves just to stimulate that heat stress or that um, additional strain on the body um, is really important uh, in getting that ad adaptation. And for athletes, we're doing all three of those. We're using saunas, environmental rooms, and overdressing, or just going out in the heat of the day for certain training sessions. And we found that that is the best, more in a, an applied world rather than just from a research world, is that that gives us the best ability to maximize on our training and our recovery with optimizing our heat adaptation, getting ready for our performance. Yeah. And that makes sense too, because you can't, I, I would assume that you could probably get like the plasma volume response that you wanted to out of a passive heat acclimatization protocol using sauna, but from a, like the mental side of things and the perceived effort, once an athlete, if they've never ridden in um, heat and humid before, but they did all the sauna and then they go into a race environment and they start going, the perceived effort at race pace is going to be ticked up quite a few as opposed to the people who did their aerobic training and maybe even some race base like in that environment as well right yeah exactly yeah. so okay. yeah i mean and again it's and again the the most important thing that we do in our heat stress testing our assessments or evaluations is that it's really athlete and coach education so it's yep. going into an environment and we use all these bells and whistles so i actually can graph it out and you can visually see you know, how you're feeling um, or for running, you know, we, when we're using some of these running power meters is that we can see maybe anywhere between like five to eight minutes within our, our distance running program prior to their core temperature hitting their limit, we actually see running mechanics begin to falter. And the athletes, um, I just did a heat stress assessment a couple of weeks ago with one of our triathletes and, and, you know, they were right at 39.4 degrees internal Celsius, which we know at 39.5 mechanics and everything start to really suffer. And they turned to me and they said, oh, I don't feel good anymore. Like right at that moment. And I thought, yeah, you're really dialed in with what's happening, but now we actually can, I can visually show you what's actually changing. Um, and then it, for a lot of people, they have that aha moment of like, ah, I got it. I can see what's happening. Yeah. 
Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's super valuable for coach and athlete because it's at the end of the day when they are racing, I mean, you can have all the gadgets and stuff going on, but like, but it's just the, the continual check-in and awareness. Uh, can I keep pushing or can I not? Yeah. That's your, or that's your like, goal. Yeah, exactly. Or, or I can, I know I can keep pushing for another one or two Ks in a running right. race and that's all I need. Um, yeah. Or if I just stay at this pace and run steady. Um, when we started this whole process, one of my uh, slides and presentations I'd give, a, give to athletes was an example of the Chicago Marathon over the years. Uh, and I can't remember now without looking at it what year, but there was a year where it was exceptionally hot. And you look, they graphed out the winners in the men's race of every 5K as they're going throughout the, the race and who ended up winning. Well, the, the guy that won was the guy that ran the most steady or there was a surge somewhere right around 20, 25K into the race. And they increased their 5K split, you know, or they dropped their time by almost like 20 or 30 seconds over that 5K. And all the athletes that went with it, none of them uh, placed in the top three. And the reason for that, it, it's not because of form. All these guys can run, you know, pretty close to one another, but it was the heat sink that it did it in those conditions that they couldn't recover from it. Um, so it's just, like you said, it's learning that and understanding it and then having the confidence on race day to execute your plan and not get caught up in, you know, what's happening all around you. Yep. Yep. That's it. That is it. Well, um, I know we've got a lot to talk about still, and I know you mentioned, uh, uh, pre-cooling and hydration. So let's, let's touch on that. And then we can, um, start to wrap this up a little bit, but when you're talking about pre-cooling, um, what is, what is the goal here and and what are we trying to achieve? Yeah. So pre-cooling we use prior to, we're going to talk about just competition here is that what are we doing to like drop that core temperature, uh, to moderate that thermal load that we have. Um, so leading into um, the Tokyo Games, uh, Dr. Randy Wilbur, who's one of our senior sport physiologists, worked with Nike and we helped to design this new ice cooling, Nike ice cooling vest that's out on the market now. Um, and the goal would be that we wear that prior to going out to competition. So if you just watched uh, US track and field uh, t- um, Olympic trials, as the women were coming out for the 10K, a lot of them had these cooling vests on. And so really prior to the timing that the gun goes off, we're just trying to lower core temperature back to a stable level. We don't actually want it to get too cold so you can't respond, but bringing that core temperature right back to that like 37, 38 degrees Celsius, which is just our our normal, you know, 97, 98 degree core temperature um, that we're feeling. Um, and, And again, what that helps to do is that you're delaying that uh, onset or decreasing the initial ramp rate um, at, at the beginning of a race. So if the race is going to go out hard, um, really short, you know, from the beginning, whether it's a running race, a cycling race, or triathlon, is that we're helping to just dissipate that heat early on. Um, in addition to cooling vests, there's a lot of stuff out there just on drinking like ice slurries and ice slushy drinks. Um, and that you have to drink quite a bit for it to be truly impactful. So that's something that you, you need to train and practice with. You don't want to try it out just out of the blue um, prior to like a really intense training session or race day. Um, but that has shown that it can help to decrease or delay the onset again of a, a higher core temperature. And, and going back to what you talked about in the beginning is that when we can moderate our heat with heat acclimatization or delaying the onset of that, of that core temperature where we know performance starts to decline, we're, we're increasing our odds for success, right? So again, we're not necessarily gonna stop it, our core temperature from reaching really high, high extreme levels, but we're delaying the time that it can get from point A to point B. Yep, exactly. And so with those ice vests, I mean, the athlete is uh, warming up, right? Doing their warm up protocol. And then just before the event, they slip on an ice vest or some cooling device and they go up to the, the line, right? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I was just saying, sometimes like you might do, depending on the length of your race or what you're doing, you might warm up in the cooling vest mm-hmm. um, or you might put the cooling vest on after your warm up. It kind of just depends on the timeline of what you want to do. Um, one tactic um, that depending right now, watching the Tour de France, like 
that you might see prior to like a time trial or other type of races is that they'll be wearing their cooling vest during a warm up or something like a game ready that actually has a continuous flow of cooling cold water rather than just ice. Um, uh, and again, they're doing that during a warm up so they can actually go harder in the warm up without raising the core temperature prior to towing the line. So there's a couple different ways to do it, but ultimately it depends on the length of the race, how intense the race also has to be right from the start of how you actually want to your, your different approaches that you want to apply it to. Exactly. So I just wanted to also clarify all the people who are now Googling Nike ice vest and <laughs> they, they get a couple and they don't, they're like, wait, how do I use this now? Um, it's pretty, pretty simple. Um, and I would even go a step further and say, you know, warm up, then throw it on to cool down a little bit before, but just like Lindsay said, it's like, um, like if it is hot, like if you're setting up your trainer and you're already sweating, throw it on if, if you have yeah. it, right. <laughs> it's yeah. just, just delay it, just delay it. Um, cool. And I, I know that uh, in other races in, in mountain biking and stuff, and I don't know if Miller's going to, or if, if this is even legal in the Olympics, but um, like an ice sock type of protocol for cooling um, on course, is that going to yeah. be, yeah. Yeah, it'll be used for sure. So you can use ice socks and hand ups. The IOC has allowed some different uh, modalities for this Olympic games than they have in mm -hmm. prior games. Um, so they're, they're allowing hand, hand ups like that, that okay. you can, yeah. you know, take ice socks and different things, um, at different points during the course. Uh, and prior, yeah. part of that is they don't want an athlete to, you know, obviously have a heat, heat episode during right. competition or even after. Um, so, but we want to have good racing, right? So we've got to find mm -hmm. that balance of like pushing the body to maximal limits, but making sure that we're being smart and have the right tools. Yeah. Ice, uh, cold ice sock is like heaven on a hot day. So yeah. Super yeah. simple. <laughs> yeah, very, very simple. Very simple. Um, okay. Kind of changing to uh, hydration and fueling. So clearly this is super important uh, for an athlete's success. We've talked about it before on this podcast, but um, specifically with some of the protocols that we're talking about here, Lindsay, uh, what's the goal for the athlete leading up to the race and then during the race? And then if we have time, we can talk about like a post-race and training session. Yeah. And I mean, it's like everything else, right? It's like a multi-layered question. So yep. um, like, if you look at the men's road race and the women's road race on this for cycling, they're both really long is that we're going to try to get to the start in a, a well or you hydrated state. They're actually going to be, the goal is carrying extra hydration going into that event, because we just know that you're going to be limited by how much you can consume uh, on a course or how much you're going to be sweating out. It's going to be a, a fine line of balancing that. And same thing for the time trial is that, you know, on a time trial, you're not going to want to carry an extra bottle right on your bike because that's additional weight. And there's a pretty significant climb on the time trial course. So we're going to make sure that we've got, you know, maybe carrying one or two pounds of extra hydration prior to the gun starting off. So we don't have to rely on that, the weight of the actual bottle on the, on the bike. Um, then there's other events where um, it may not be as much of an issue, um, like triathlon and the mixed relay. They're doing a, the, the mixed relay is four athletes doing a 20 minute race where they tag off to the next person for 20 minutes. You know, you go for it. We're not doing, we're too worried about having bottles on the course, hand ups on the run course. They're going to be there, take them if the opportunity presents itself. But if not, you got to go for it. You're racing. And that'd be the same thing for like a 5K on the track or a mile, right? You know, there, there's, you just got to go for it and, and rely on that heat adaptation that you've done. Um, but I think it's a really easy thing. Um, hydration, weigh yourself before, weigh yourself after training sessions, see what your hydration loss is. Everyone's very different as your fitness changes, that actually changes too. Um, so you don't want to just do it once a year, you know, do it a, you know, a few times or as you're changing your, your, your training cycles. Um, to really get an idea of, you know, how much water loss you're losing. And then you know what you need to be replacing in training or um, even on the back end for recovery. So everybody should, you know, do their pre-race perfectly and come come to the line topped off, ready to go. And then it just depends based on the specificity, duration, how long they're going in terms of how to fuel throughout the event, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 And I mean, you know, hydration, it's one of those things that it seems so simple. And I don't even know when I was at CTS, uh, I remember reading uh, from a triathlete, Chris McCormick, you know, he said, one of the things that 
finally allowed him to like have great success in Kono is that he drank more on the run than he ever had before. It was something so simple, right? And you think, man, he's a pro, he's won all these races, he's done all these things and he can't get it dialed in in this race. And it's just simple that he had to drink in almost three bottles more than what he had been doing. And that was what helped him, you know, to have success in that day in that condition. So I think if you're constantly finding that you're not succeeding in these extreme conditions, that you need to kind of reevaluate not just only the training, but what maybe your hydration and nutrition plan are. And it could be on the opposite. And maybe you're taking in way too much relative to the event or you're not enough. But I think it's something that's so simple and that we don't think is always an obstacle, even at the highest end of, of, of our elite athletes. Um, but we see it all the time and, and little changes can be quite impactful. So. Yeah. Yeah. All the time. And I, and I think it's one of the most simple things to deploy correctly, but it's, it's oftentimes just the number one thing that's overlooked and it's kind of ridiculous in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I do want to ask though, like if, if there's an athlete just say like a marathon or Olympic uh, distance triathlete two hours or less, I mean, are they, there's going to be a, a fueling component to that, but are they at all concerned about a post race, um, uh, replenishment situation? If they just have like one race one day and they're going for it and are they all, at all concerned about like how I feel the next day or do we get to the Olympics? You do that. And then it's just like, whatever. Yeah. I mean, I think if it's the Olympics are probably the extreme example of it for a lot of athletes, but even, you know, even all of us, right. You're preparing for like your one event. Um, and again, I think it's important what you said, it's like two hours or less. Mm -hmm. So if it's a two hours or less, you can get away with doing some really crazy things, um, that, you know, your hydration and nutrition feeling, as long as you're doing everything properly prior to the start of that race, you can get away with really poor decisions or, maybe that's the intent is to walk away very dehydrated, um, that that can allow for, you know, best per- world record performances, knowing yeah. that you don't have to back it up the next day or even in a few days time. I think the biggest thing is that like, now you start thinking like three hours or more, or I think of like, right, like the Leadville 100 mountain bike race and people yeah. out there like 10 hours, like you, you, you have to make sound decisions for those type of events because it's so taxing in itself. So there are some, like, as I mentioned, like the mixed relay 20 minute race, like you're just going for it there, you know, you, there's no holding back, but even for a two hour race, so the marathon, a 10 K running race, the triathlon there, those are all like about two hours is that we're doing just enough to get by, but we're not actually trying to worry about staying within that three to 5% hydration status. We're kind of doing just enough to maximize on performance without causing any disruptions to the race plan um and you know again the athletes when they're out there you might even have the best plan but all of a sudden they come through the the checkpoint or handoff but that's the deciding moment and someone could attack through the aid station and you've got to be able to make sure that they can get through that two hours with little to no hydration or nutrition yeah yeah that's that's just it and it's it's a fine line too i mean any I would always err on the side of, you know, more ideal, uh, hydration and fueling for sure. Um, but it's a fine line of depleting and, and going for it when, um, you know, gold medals on the line for sure. Yeah, I know it's crazy, but you know, it's sport, right? So yep. we also have to keep things in mind too, is that, you know, we're talking about the Olympics, but if, if, if it's your own personal Olympics, but you still have to get home and you've got like four <laughs> kids at home and a full-time job and, You you have to keep in mind that you can't be just completely wasted because yes, we, as coaches, we want to see you succeed on that day in sport, but you also have to succeed in life outside of sport too. So, right. So depending on what your world is, like, we've just got to keep things kind of in the right context of what you, what your timeline is, where you are and all the other responsibilities you have, like on the field and then off the field, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. 
Gosh, Lindsay, I feel like we could we could literally talk for hours and we didn't even touch on altitude, which um, is yeah. kind of like your expertise. So maybe when life settles post Tokyo, we get you back on for some altitude talk. But uh, uh, heat's a huge stress and it's a big factor to consider when you're implementing this into your training program, whether you're, you're going for Kona uh, or La, La Ruta or the Olympics, it's, it's a thing to consider in your training. Lindsay mapped out why the heat can hurt you, how best to train for it, to minimize the stress and to delay that rise in core temperature that she was talking about. It's inevitable. It will go up and there probably will be some performance decrement, but these uh, tips and, and tricks and training protocols that she's talking about will help you feel better and perform longer at these events. So Lindsay, any, any final words of, of wisdom to our listeners who, you know, maybe never even thought about training for the heat uh how would what would you tell them when when they have an event coming up yeah i think i mentioned it earlier but you know look at your event and work backwards and make sure you've got a couple trials um where you're you're putting yourself through these stresses far out prior to your big competition so you just know what to expect there's again a lot of research that shows that even if you're not getting ready for a hot and humid environment doing heat adaptation still has positive Uh, applications towards training and competitions in the cold. So you're not going to lose out on anything by doing something, even if it's just a short three to five day kind of touch, touch in and see how things are going. Um, But I I think it's important to know like where, where our body's limits are um, and understand, you know, get that feeling. So when you're out there competing and training that you can make good decisions of, you know, I'm at my limit and I need to slow down else I'm not gonna to get to the finish line or if I drink a little bit more or make sure my bottle's a little bit colder um, that I can actually go a little bit further or go a little bit harder. So um, I think practice in this thing, in this context would, is really important and really critical to just to optimize your performance, whatever your end game or end goal might be. Couldn't agree more, words of wisdom right there. <laughs> so Lindsay, thank you so much. I mean, yeah, I learned thanks. a ton. I learned a ton. I know our listeners are going to learn a lot from this and I really appreciate you taking the time, uh, your busy day to, to jump on this, uh, this podcast. So, uh, good luck to you. Good luck to team USA in Tokyo and, uh, we'll be watching. Perfect. Thanks, Adam. Thanks.